this phrase from the King James Version of Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, describes the way most Christians throughout history have felt that Jesus' second coming is soon, very soon, near at the very door. And that has been more true in the past century, the 20th century, and in this century, largely because of one, I believe, misinterpretation of Matthew chapter 24. It is hard to overestimate the power of this interpretation publicized, largely spread through a book by Hal Lindsey called Late Great Planet Earth that the prophetic clock began ticking again in 1948 when Israel became a nation and the nation of Israel is represented by the fig tree and so when Jesus says when you see the fig tree blooming then know it is near at the very door that 1948 meant that is the generation 40 years brought us to 1988 and there was a prophetic fervor about Jesus coming by 1988 but somehow this generation is the generation that Jesus talked about that would see all of these things take place. Is Jesus Christ coming near at the very door? I don't know, and I don't believe anyone knows, but many believe they know on the basis of the interpretation of the passage that we look at tonight in Matthew chapter 24, the parable of the fig tree. This entire interpretation that places Jesus' words in this generation, not that generation, the first generation that Jesus spoke to, this generation is based upon this parable, and it is very dangerous to base any uh, interpretation based upon a parable. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, and remember that last time, two weeks ago, we studied this climactic section that is almost universally interpreted as the second coming. And Jesus said all these things would take place in this generation. Here, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, almost universally recognized as Jesus' second coming. And it sounds a lot like it. The sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven, the tribes of earth mourning, see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, gathering his, to get his elect together with the sound of a trumpet. But Jesus said all these things will take place in this generation. That seems like a contradiction to us because that generation is dead and gone 20 centuries ago. And so many have said Jesus didn't mean that generation in the first century. Jesus must have meant this generation, some future distant generation. Hi, I'm Jeff Hartman, pastor of First Baptist Church of Troy, North Carolina. And tonight we continue our study in Matthew 24 and 25 with a ninth study of 14. And tonight we look at the parable of the fig tree. Jesus began and ended this passage, 23 through 25, with parentheses that tell us the time frame. Matthew 23, 36, Assuredly, verily, verily, in the old King James, I say to you, I mean it, all these things, not some, all these things will come upon this generation. This is called a near demonstrative. This, not that. This means near, that means far. When Jesus says this generation, he has to be talking about the generation he's speaking to. Otherwise, he would be miscommuning, miscommunicating and misleading them. He ends the passages, and that's not all the way at the end, but it's after that second coming passage. Jesus says, so you also, when you, this generation, see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation... Not some future generation, this generation, first century generation, will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Well, wait a minute. The second coming didn't take place. Is Jesus a false prophet? Does the Bible contain an error? Is this prophecy untrue? Well, let's assume that Jesus is telling the truth 
and he knows what he's talking about. So how in the world does all of this fit into the first century? Go back and look at last time's study, and we'll see the sound of the great trumpet, the many ways in which that is talking not about the second coming, but about Jesus' ascension into heaven. But let's now go ahead with this passage and see what it is determinative about the time of all, Matthew 23, 24, and 25. Near at the very door, what is Jesus talking about, some future generation or that generation to Jesus, this generation? Here's our text for tonight, Matthew 24, 32. Now learn the parable, this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Well, it's obvious. When you see spring coming, the flowers, you know that summer's around the corner. So you also, when you see, not some future generation, but you disciples, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. When someone is close, they may be five minutes away, but when they say, I'm at the door, they've already arrived. They're just, all you have to do is go and open the door, right? Assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, this generation, now we've come to that bracket, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So here is what Jesus tells us about all these things, including, to us mysteriously, supposedly his second coming. If all these things took place in the first century, maybe, just maybe, it wasn't the second coming, and Jesus' word did come true. Let's look at this illustration of the fig tree. It's a parable, but Jesus is using an illustration to help them understand. You want to know, when will these things be? Remember the question they asked in Matthew 24, 3. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? So he wants to tell them, learn this parable from the fig tree. Now, I want to talk about the parable of the fig tree. He's talking to them about how soon it will be, not how distant it will be, how soon it will be. Remember, they asked about these things, the destruction of the temple. We know that took place in the first century in a generation. But they also asked about his coming and his kingdom. Let's look at what parables do. What does a parable do? Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 is asked by his disciples, why do you speak to them in parables? So here's the question, Jesus, why do you use parables? He answered, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now this passage is often misused, I believe, to say that Jesus used parables to confuse the issue, to speak in secret code. But the purpose of an illustration, the very root of the word illustrious, illustration means to let the light in. When I'm preaching and I'm getting involved in some doctrine, sometimes people's eyes start to close and they lose focus. But when I tell an illustration, a story, people light up because they love stories. That's the way we learn. Did Jesus use parables to turn the light on so people could understand? Or did he use parables to hide the truth so his disciples would get the inside information and everyone else would be in the dark? Oftentimes, this passage is used to say that Jesus wanted to tell them mysteries of the kingdom, but to hide it from the others. Actually, I think that's the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying. I use parables so that you may know. I use parables so that you will understand near at the very door, not literally at the door, but that illustration helps us to see how close it is. I use these so that you may know. Parables, like illustrations in a sermon, are meant to illustrate, to let the light in, to help us understand. But the problem is you have ears to hear and you know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because you understand the parables. But to them it has not been given because they don't believe so they're not listening to the truth, and to them, the parables, they take them woodenly literal. When they take them literally, they miss the point. And the problem is that they don't believe Jesus, so seeing, 
they do not see. Not because Jesus is hiding the truth from them, but because they're closing their eyes. The three students used to say after an injury, I can't see, I can't see. And Mo would say, why not? Because I've got my eyes closed. That's exactly what's going on in the first century. They don't see, even though they have eyes. They don't hear, even though they have ears. They don't understand. He's saying they could get it if they wanted to, but their ears are stopped up. Their eyes are closed. I give a parable so you might understand. So we don't base doctrine on a parable, but doctrine can be made clear through a parable. And he gave all these parables so that they could understand. I want you to know that there is a parable of the fig tree that's already out there. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus spoke this parable, verse 6. A certain man had a fig tree. You know, there's a parable of the fig tree. Is that what Jesus is referring to? A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. He said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But the vine dresser said, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Let's give it one last chance. If it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. What is Jesus referring to here? The fig tree was a symbol of Israel. And you remember the cluster of grapes that Israel carried out, the spies carried out from the promised land. That was actually their symbol, like our American eagle, bald eagle, perhaps. But the fig tree was often used as a picture of Israel. And here, the fig tree almost certainly does represent first century Israel as Jesus the Messiah comes and he's looking for some fruit, but he finds none. And so he's going to cut it down, but he's going to give a last chance. Here's the parable of the fig tree. When Jesus comes and inspects for fruit, he wants to find some. There is no fruit for three years. That's how long Jesus' ministry was, coincidentally, you think. But there's one last chance given to it. Actually, this is not only a parable, but this is an actual story in the New Testament. You remember literally Jesus in the morning as he returned to the city was hungry and seeing a fig tree, a literal fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. Jesus is God, has omniscience. Did he know, could he know that there was no figs on it? Yes, but he didn't choose to know. Oftentimes he asked questions, he would go looking. So here, he may have known it was empty and was doing this to illustrate not finding leaves on Israel's tree. Or maybe Jesus actually was going hungry and didn't use his omniscience, but he found no fruit on it but leaves. And so he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Jesus cursed the fig tree, but he wasn't doing that because he was an angry jerk. He was doing that to illustrate, if I come to you and I find no fruit on you, I might cut you down. If I come to the nation of Israel and they reject me, I might turn to the church. Immediately the fig tree withered away. The fig tree is not only a parable, it's something that Jesus did as a living parable, but it is highly symbolic. Israel might be the fruit tree, right? The fig tree. He says, ever again? Never again? Well, he also tells us he will give a second chance to this fig tree. But this is the interpretation that we should be bringing to mind when Jesus talks about the fig tree. He actually says in Revelation chapter 6, the stars of heaven fell to earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Now it's talking again about a fig tree. This is not as related, but even in Revelation, notice the fig tree is used as a parable, as an illustration to help us understand. So what is Jesus talking about when he gets to talking about the fig tree. Is he talking about some 20th century establishment of a nation in Palestine, the beginning of the state of Israel? Or is he talking about that century and looking for fruit? In Hosea chapter 9, the prophet Isaiah writes, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. That was their true symbol. Remember the grapevines as the so big that it took two men to carry them. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. Israel is here again represented as the fig tree. 
He calls, Jesus calls himself the true vine and we are the branches in John chapter 15. But largely when he's talking about Israel, he uses the fig tree. Romans chapter 11 uses the olive tree uh, as Paul is talking about the breaking off of the tree of Israel. He's talking about the second chance in Romans 11. But some of the branches were broken off Israel because of unbelief they were broken off. But they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. So when first century Israel rejected Christ, they gave up their chance. But Romans chapter 11, read it in its entirety, is all about, yes, Israel had first chance, but they blew it. And now God has given it to the Gentiles, to the church. But when the Gentiles are faithful to the Great Commission, they will reach Israel and they can be grafted in. How much easier is it for God to graft them in than it was for him to graft us in? This is a very important biblical symbol. The olive tree, the grapevine, the fig. But breaking off the branches, he is saying that there is judgment if there is no fruit. But I want you to know, if you're going to base your doctrine of Jesus coming back in the first 40 years after 1948, of course, that didn't work out. And so now we're coming up on a second 40 years, right? So... What is actually going on here? If you're basing Jesus coming, having been turned on the prophetic clock in 1948, actually looking at this parable in its other telling, Luke chapter 21 just blows it all out of the water. Because there Luke records it this way. He spoke to them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now need, near. See, this is the same context. You also, when you, this generation, see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near at the very doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Jesus, in telling the story, Matthew says the, the fig tree. Luke records it as the fig tree and all the trees. And certainly that is true. All the trees are the same way. When spring comes and the leaves bud, you know that summer is near. It is not just the fig tree, and I would suggest that that means it is not the modern state of Israel gathered together in unbelief politically in 1948. That's not what's being talked about here. I think it's entirely different, and if we are faithful to the context, if we read it in the context, when he talks about the parable of the fig tree, he is not talking about a distant 20th century, 1948 regathering of unbelieving Israel. Is that the fulfillment of scripture? Or is Jesus talking about a near first century, 70 AD judgment of unbelieving Israel? He's talking not about a wonderful, isn't it great? The flowers are blooming. He's actually talking about when you see this, that's about to happen. And he's talking about unbelieving Israel and what does unbelieving Israel deserve? Judgment, and that's what it got. First century, not 20th century or 21st century Israel. They didn't reject the Messiah. First century did. And so I think in the context, Jesus talking about the fig tree, he's talking about cutting off, cursing that which does not bear fruit. He's not talking about some future timeline that started in 1948. That's the illustration of immediate closeness. Let's look at the explanation of that closeness as we go on in the end of verse 32. You know that summer's near. So verse 33, you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Jesus is finally, all the way back to verse 3, answering the question the disciples asked, when will all these things be? And so Jesus is going to explain like many of his parables, Jesus will explain it to his disciples. It's meant to be easy to understand, but people misunderstood them, so Jesus would explain the parables. He's going to explain the parable of the fig tree. He's going to explain how soon this is, not how distant this is. So now he's going to tell us, this generation will see it. You will know. You also, when you see these things, know that it is near in your time. This is the same point that Jesus makes in a different passage in Luke chapter 12. He said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, 
A shower is coming. You understand when the, when the leaves start budding, when the flowers start blooming, spring is here, summer's around the corner. Well, when you see rain clouds, when you see dark clouds or hear thunder or see lightning, you know a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather. We see all around us things, and we're not always 100% right, but usually we can get it. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Jesus uses this parable, this illustration, to explain there are certain signs, and you'll know that it's going to take place. But notice he says to that generation, you will see it. He said to the disciples, you will see it. When you see all these things, he says, he's not saying when you see the parable of the fig tree. That's what late great planet Earth says. When you see Israel become a nation in 1948, then start the calendar, start the countdown. He's not talking about the state of Israel being reestablished in the Holy Land. He's talking about all these things. And what does all these things mean? I like to say all means all, and that's all all means. He's not talking about one thing, the parable of the fig tree, summer's near. He's talking about all these things going back to verse 4. It's not the fig tree and what it symbolizes. It's all the things, including the, the fig tree is just an illustration of seeing all these things. He's talking about all these things, like in verse 36. From Matthew 23 to Matthew 24, he's talking about all these things, the destruction of the temple and wars and rumors of wars and persecutions and famine. He's talking about what they asked. Jesus said to them, do you see all these things? He's pointing to the temple. They just said, look at the temple. He says, do you see all these things? Surely, verily, verily, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. All these things. When he's talking about all these things, he may even be pointing. See all this? See all this? Not one stone will be left upon another. Also in the next verse, this is what they ask about. They said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When Jesus says, when you see all these things, he's not talking about 1948 and the modern state of Israel. He's talking about all these things, the destruction of the temple in the first century, and all the other things that Jesus is going to be talking about. For instance, in verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things, hear the repetition, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And 70 AD came to pass, and that even wasn't the end of the world. He says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Hey, look, it's just part of history. It's not the end of the world. So when he comes to verse 34, and he brackets it, when you see all these things, know that it is near. Now, this is our context. All these things is not the parable of victory. When you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things, you can't miss the reputation Repetition takes place. It is not that phrase. It is the whole discourse, the whole chapter. Jesus is not talking about the parable of the fig tree. He's talking about literally all these, not this one thing, all these things. When you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. I'm calling this immediate closeness, immediate proximity. It's not 20 centuries away in 1948 if it was Jesus would certainly seem to be misleading them. He's talking about something that would be then, not now. Something that would be this generation, not this generation, but that generation. And so, he's talking about 68, 69, 70 AD, their lifetime. That's answering the question that they asked in Matthew 24, 3. They asked, when will these things be? So, in Luke 21, 31, the parallel passage, Jesus says, this is Luke's account of the same passage. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Is the kingdom of God, the millennium, the heavenly eternity, 
Or is it the church's establishment? When you see these things, the destruction of the temple, this is a sign that God's working in a new way and the kingdom of God is here in Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but reigning through his saints here on the earth. The kingdom of God is something that would not take place in the 20th century. It didn't happen in 1988. It's not happening in the generation after 1948 because it has nothing to do with 1948. The kingdom of God is near because Jesus was there then and he was about to go to heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father and to reign. And so the explanation is, this is not some prediction about a distant 1948, 20th century regathering of unbelieving Israel. This is talking about a near first century, 70 AD judgment of un un unbelieving Israel and all of the other things, the destruction of the temple, and of all the persecution and all the things that Jesus predicted. That's what's meant here, not the opposite. That someday, in the distant future, all these things, the whole point is, is that it is near, at the very door, now. And so it must be something that has already happened. So let's look at the exclamation. Here's what he says of closeness in general. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This is true. It's going to come past, and if it comes to pass, it has to come to pass in the first century. This generation, the near demonstrative, Jesus didn't say that generation, some future generation. He said this generation. Here we finally get to the time determinative that Jesus gave to them. Oftentimes, people say, well, we take the Bible literally. No, you don't when you say the star is falling. But they take things literally, and they don't take Jesus' timing literally. He says, this generation. Let's see how the Bible uses the word, this generation. Some misuse the word and say, well, we don't mean this generation like the people living now. Jesus meant this nation. The nation of Israel won't pass away. And miraculously, it hasn't passed away, but that's not what he means by this generation. Here's what generation means. Matthew chapter 1, same book, Matthew 24. Jesus' genealogy. All the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. So what's a generation? It's a group of people all living at the same time, but a generation takes place, and then there's another generation, another generation. We have the baby boomer generation, the millennial generation, the X. Gen Xers, a generation is all the people who live at one time. It's not nations. The generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David to the captivity in Babylon, 14 generations from the captivity in Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. Generation, the Greek word, which is genea, generation is not a race. It's not a nation like the United States from 1776 till today, but it's contemporaries. This generation means this group of Americans who are alive together today. It's those alive at one time. Some will say that it is a nation, but it doesn't mean that. Actually, I want you to see a relative word. John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 7. John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, and he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Brood of vipers is literally generation of vipers. A brood is a litter of puppies. It's all one group siblings. But it's here he's calling them, and as Jesus does in Matthew 12, 34, Jesus later calls them a brood of vipers. It is a related word, and it means this generation. It doesn't mean the whole nation and all of its history. It means this generation. I want you to see as we go through Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, in red letters, Jesus says, to what shall I liken this generation? Who's he talking about? The nation of Israel? No, he's talking about this generation of Israel. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companion and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned you and you did not lament. Jesus is saying, you have a unique opportunity of all the generations of Israel, past and future. You're the one that got the promise of the Messiah. And what did you do when God said, here's my son, come and dance, come and celebrate. What did you do? You missed it. He doesn't have much to say good about this generation, and understandably so. He says, 
what, what's up with this generation? Matthew chapter 12, he calls them an evil and adulterous generation because they asked for a sign. What about all the miracles I just, I just raised the dead, fed the thousands and calmed the sea. What do you need? He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment against this generation and condemn it. Why? Because Nineveh got a warning and they repented. You got a warning and you didn't. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. So shall also with this wicked generation. What does Jesus say about this generation that had the Son of Man sent to them, the promise of God fulfilled to them, literally, physically bonded? He doesn't have much to say good about that generation to us today, but in Jesus' time it was this generation. So which generation is Jesus talking about? 20th century generation that regathered in unbelief in 1948. In Matthew 16, 4, Jesus again says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it, that generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. You remember what the sign of the prophet of Jonah was? As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days. Let me ask you a simple question. What generation uniquely, individually, only got the sign of the death and the resurrection of Christ? That generation, or as Jesus would say, this generation, that evil and adulterous generation that sought sign after sign, even after Jesus gave hundreds. Jesus gave the ultimate sign, the resurrection from the dead and when Jesus rose from the grave, what did they do? Say, he must be God. No, they said, how are we going to cover this up? Now we're going to lose our place. Oh, what are we going to do to hide the truth that the tomb is empty and that Jesus has been seen by hundreds? Who saw the resurrection? That generation. Or as Jesus would say, this generation. Matthew 17, 17, Jesus said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. Not much good to say about this generation. How long will I be with you? This generation is the only generation that had Jesus physically and bodily. How long shall I bear with you, this generation? Bring him here to me. Here's someone who wants to be healed and he's bemoaning their lack of belief. But when he talks about this generation, it's the only generation that saw the resurrection. It's the only generation that had the incarnation and they had the crucifixion. This is the generation that Jesus is talking about. And so that's why when we come to Matthew 23, verse 36, this generation, notice Jesus again using that word, serpents, brood of vipers, generation of vipers, how can you, first generation Israel, escape the condemnation of hell? I send you prophets. 20th century Israel didn't get any prophets, did they? I send you wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues. This is Israel. They have synagogues. That on you, not some future generation that didn't say crucify him, let his blood be on our heads. This generation that said it, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Assuredly, Jesus says, here's the beginning parentheses. I say to you, first century Israel, all these things will come upon this generation. I don't know how we could miss it, but somehow most prophecy experts have missed what Jesus is plainly saying. This generation is the generation that rejected the Christ, had him crucified, refused to believe, even when he rose from the dead, and this is the generation that will receive the judgment that Jesus promises in Matthew 23, 24, and 25. This is not racist. This is not anti-Semitic. I'm not talking about all Israel today. I'm talking about a very specific generation in history in the first century that deserved judgment and indeed got it exactly as Jesus had predicted. Jesus said this generation will by no means pass away. <coughs> and this is how the New Testament uses the word. On the day of Pentecost, after Jesus has ascended to heaven, Peter says to assembled Jews from all over the world, on the day of Pentecost. With many other words, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Not from this nation, because Peter is a part of that nation. But he's talking about that generation, the ones that rejected Christ. Peter, 
had been listening to what Jesus said, and he had adopted Jesus' attitude towards that generation. If you're going to take scripture literally, you have to take the time indicators literally, and you have to understand the context, and Jesus clearly says it's this generation, it is first century, it is unbelieving Israel, it is not 1948, it is not near the very door now, it was near the very door then. Is Jesus' second coming now very near? We don't know, but we can't base it upon this passage that it's near to 1948. I want us to see if we're going to take these verses, Jesus' words, seriously, that we have to take all of Jesus' words seriously, including when he says, the Son of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, send his angels with the great sound of trumpet, they will gather together as elect. This is in between those two parentheses. And so this cannot mean the second coming because the second coming didn't come in the first century. When we look back, go back to the last study, see, it's not the Son of Man returning, it's the sign of the Son of Man. And as we learned last time, the sign that the Son of Man is in heaven will be the destruction of the temple. It's not the Son of Man coming to earth, it's the Son of Man coming to heaven. Son of Son of Man will appear, and it's not the... Not the sun, but the sign will appear, and it's the Son of Man will be in heaven. The sign that the Son of Man is in heaven will appear on earth, the destruction of the temple. And all the tribes, that's Israel, of earth will mourn, and that's actually literally the tribes of the land will mourn. And they, unbelieving Israel, will see, they will see the sign of judgment, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. The exact language that Jesus used in Matthew 26 when he said to the high priest, you will see the Son of Man reigning. How? Because you'll see the destruction of the temple, as I said. They will gather together his elect. Here he's talking about gathering together believers, not talking about the rapture at the end of time. This must be, if we take Jesus' word seriously, not his second coming, but his coming in judgment upon Israel by the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. When you see but stop and think one more time. When you see the sign of man coming, then know that it is near. It doesn't even make any sense when you see all these things, including the sign of the Son of Man coming. No, the, his coming can't be a sign of his coming, right? So all of these things that Jesus is in heaven, not coming to earth, is a sign that Jesus' word is being fulfilled. It's not just these time indicators, but I want you to see at the very end, Jesus says, everything I say, you got to take seriously. Every jot and tittle. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. If you don't take these time indicators seriously, then you make Jesus out to be a false prophet somehow. And Jesus says, all my words are important. So listen to what I'm saying and take them literally and understand what I'm saying. Remember, he's talking about heaven and earth pass away. This, is this a literal destruction of the physical universe? This is prophetic language that is used throughout Scripture. Lift up your eyes, Isaiah 51, 6. This used to be one of my favorite verses as a teenager. I quoted this as my life verse. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment. And those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. This verse persuaded me that eternal things are more important than just temporary things. And this verse helped me to recognize what's really important in life. And so I memorized this verse and I would use this as my life verse. But here he's talking about the heavens being temporary and the earth being temporary, heaven and earth passing away. And this is prophetic language. Hey, these things are all temporary. They're not important. The most important thing is what's eternal, like your soul. We see this language then in Isaiah 66, the last chapter, where there's a new heavens and a new earth. Does that sound familiar? As the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. He's not talking about the end of time. He's talking about a new heavens and a new earth that came in 70 AD when the old kingdom passed away and Christ came in his kingdom and now reigns through his church. Remember this collapsing universe type of language when you read the heaven 
the earth passing away and the stars falling, this is Old Testament language, highly symbolic. But here it's symbolic of both judgment on Israel, but upon blessings upon the world. And so when we see Jesus say in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away, we should be reminded of Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is filled. So if we take this seriously, we have to take all of Jesus' words seriously, including Matthew 24, not only that Jesus will come, but that what he was talking about in Matthew 24 would be in the first century. So if we really want to take Jesus' words seriously, then we have to take these time indicators seriously. And so we have to understand that Jesus is not talking about the second coming here. Yes, he will come again. But is it near at the very doors because Israel regathered as a nation politically in 1948 in unbelief? No, he was talking about the first century. And so we must understand that these time indicators, these brackets, Matthew 23, 36, Matthew 24, 34, take all of these things and mean they take place in that generation, the first century. And that means what about today? Will that temple be rebuilt? I don't believe the Bible anywhere says that it will be. But if it is, you need to understand, if it is, it will be blasphemous. Sacrificing animals in addition to the eternal Sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice has been done away. And so many believers today are waiting for the next sign that Jesus is coming. Okay, we've got Israel, but the temple would be rebuilt. We don't need a new temple. We have Jesus Christ. The Old Testament economy will end, and it did, with a flourish. But God's grace is great. And because of his patience, his long-suffering, our world has continued for 20 centuries, and you and I are alive and able to receive his grace. And if Jesus tarries, centuries more will pass and more people will be able to come to the kingdom. Is Jesus returned around the temple? I don't know, but I know it has nothing to do with 1948. That's not what Jesus was talking about. That is some mistaken speculation, and it leads to disillusionment when all of these false prophecies don't come true. The truth is we don't know when Jesus is coming. Is it near the very door? I don't know, but it has nothing to do with 1948. It might be, I want to live as if it is, but I also want to plan and I want to work as if we have centuries yet of people to reach for Jesus Christ. This fact that Jesus delayed his second coming, that's what we'll look at next, the delay that Jesus will tell us about, has given us a chance to reach the world for Christ. And so, the closing of the door on first century Israel is an opening of God's grace to all nations, to all generations, including ours. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for putting up with your Old Testament people and with us when we sin. But Lord, when judgment falls, we know we deserve it. We know you are gracious and you extend uh, almost unfathomable grace and forgiveness. Lord, thank you for the way you have spared our country in spite of our unbelief and our sin. Lord, I pray that we would repent of our sin and turn to you because we know that if you don't judge America, you owe Israel an apology. Lord, we deserve your judgment, but Lord, help us to repent. Lord, help us to see your words and to take them seriously and not speculate about when you will come again, but to work as if it might be today or tomorrow, but to plan as if it may not be for 10,000 years. For in Christ's name we pray. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you join us again next week as we go on to the next verses.